Ahead on Daytime Buffalo, we've got the Birchfield's Penny Art Center in studio to talk about how you can support Western New York art. And m and Bank's African American Resource Group of Western New York stops by to talk about their mission during Black History Month and beyond. It's all coming up right here on Daytime Buffalo. Good afternoon, hello, and welcome to Daytime Buffalo. I'm your host, Chelsea Lavelle. We have finally made it to the end of the work week, and on behalf of all of us here, we want to thank you for tuning in to Daytime Buffalo. It's been an amazing week so far with so many guests from right here in the 716, and we can't wait to bring you more. Like today, joining me in the Daytime Buffalo studio today is Scott Propeck, Executive Director of the Birchfield Penny Arts Center. Thank you for coming in, Scott. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we first want to talk about, for the viewers who don't know, what Birchfield's Penny is and what you guys do. Well, the Birchfield Penny Art Center is a museum dedicated to the art and artists of Western New York. So we actually look at the artists throughout the entire history of Western New York, but really see ourselves as an opportunity for regional artists to get engaged with the arts and hopefully build their careers to become more nationally recognized. Absolutely. And tell me about Charles Birchfield. Charles Birchfield, our namesake, is an artist that uh, we founded the museum named after him, and he moved here from Ohio, but his work from the early 20th century is in the collection of over 110 museums in the U.S. and 34 states. Wow. So he's a, a, the most internationally recognized watercolor artist in the world, but he's had shows with um, Edward Hopper and, and a variety of artists of his era. So we actually use his work as a launching point to celebrate other important artists. That's incredible. And tell me uh, about what makes artists and art from Western New York so unique like Charles Birch. Well, I think that there's something about the environment in Western New York. We have, Western New York can be an incredibly accessible place for people to learn and grow. And I think that in the arts, that's even more so. And it also provides an opportunity for artists to find studio spaces. It's not the competition that you would get in a larger city, but at the same time, there are so many arts organizations here that you have an opportunity to show your work and share your story. And it's so much more than just art. There's also book clubs, right? We have a children's book club and an adult book club. Um, and in addition to that, we have musical performances, we have theater, we have, we have dance, we have poetry. So we're a multi-art center and we celebrate every aspect of the arts. That's amazing, the, all, bringing all of the arts and even film too, right? Correct. Now, what sort of resources do you have available for those who are interested in learning more? Well, we have, from our website, you can find out about all of our workshops, the schedule for our, our book clubs. We also have um, tours of, of our exhibitions to, to get to know the artists. And that's another unique thing about our, our space is in some museums, you don't get the opportunity to meet artists because we work with regional artists, so frequently artists are in the gallery and you actually get to see the person and meet the person who made the work. That's really, really special. Now for those who don't think that their uh, artistic palette is kind of endeavored, you know what I mean? If they're not really sure about the arts, when you walk in, when you walk into Birchfield's Art Center, what do you want people to expect and learn? Well, like many things in our community, the Birchfield Penny is an incredibly welcoming space. Our staff is fantastic. When they see people and they're walking around and they're looking at things, any question that anybody has is a good question. And so we respond and we help people grow in their in their knowledge of arts and their ability to participate. So coming to something like our MNT Bank Second Fridays would give you an opportunity to see bands, to actually participate in workshops, and also see our opening exhibition. What type of educational um, uh, programs do you guys have? We have education programs that uh, that are for people of all ages, and, and and we specifically will point out if it's it's for younger learners or for adults. Just last night, we actually had a, a workshop teaching people how to make port portraits of their pets. So that was uh, mostly adults. Oh my goodness, I need to sign <laughs> up for that class. I need to get a portrait of Remy. See? <laughs> but that's like, in, in that case, it's a, it's a four session class and, and you return multiple times and you can really build your skills by taking that at, from any level that you come in at, so. What's your favorite part about working for this museum? I see the museum as a place to actually lift up our community. Um, because we have a regional focus, we have the ability to take on 
people, take on work with people in the arts at all different levels, but also help them grow in, in I see us as both a museum that presents, but also a place where we can actually help people professionally grow and actually show, uh, provide a pathway to that, to that experience. What's your background in arts? How did you fall in love with it? That's amazing because I'm a non-traditional museum person myself. I came into the museum through um, technology and through community organizing and that's the kind of place that the Virtual Penny is, is that there, I was able to find a place for myself in that space and grow myself. So when I speak about growing everybody in our community in the arts, I can speak to that firsthand. Absolutely. You don't have to be an artist yourself. You can just learn to appreciate. Mm -hmm. And that's the place to go, to get education, to be aware. Mm -hmm. And it's really special being able to meet those artists. It's it's so important. And I, don't, I, I think that frequently um, people don't rec recognize that art really is for everybody. And we, we just have to look around us and every day of our life and we'll see that you know there's images everywhere there's there's either the the built world or the natural world and we're always thinking visually and so it's a it, it's great to actually remember that it's okay and to, it is in, it's great to actually participate in the arts thank you so much scott for coming on and sharing this this is a, a local gem that maybe people didn't know about and if they do now you know where to go so come on back anytime you'd like to talk about any events you have com coming up thank you so much for having me we appreciate you. Now, coming up after the break, we continue to celebrate Black History Month. M&T Bank, African American Resource Group of Western New York, joins us next. And the secret is out. Western New York is a filmmaker favorite. We catch up with the Buffalo Niagara Film Commission to find out why. That's next. Celebrations are continuing for Black History Month, including at MMT Bank. I'm joined today by Leona Harper and Ramonda Harris. 
Thank you guys so much for being here. You guys are part of the MMT Bank's African American Resource Group of Western New York. Tell me a little bit about it. Yes, we are. Well, my, again, my name is Ramonda Harris Bonville. Uh, I'm the current president of the African American Resource Group at MNT Bank, and we are what's known as an affinity group. Uh, groups that are dedicated to making sure that everyone feels like they have a space of belonging. Um, because before there was the emphasis on uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, m and understood the importance of making spaces where everyone felt comfortable, uh, and we're one of those spaces. Very lucky for you guys having, yes, uh, you know, being working at a place that understands the importance and value of it. Yeah. Now you guys have an event happening tonight, and this is one of uh, you guys have been having for a couple of years. Something like it, right? Tell me about your celebration. Every year we try to m and Bank tries to put on a, a Black History program. It's to get us together as one to educate our people, not just the bank, but you know, the community period. And we try to bring in different acts or different uh, programs that will educate us because if you don't teach someone, you don't know. So we take um, different artists, um, different local bands. This year we're having um, art um, show with uh, Eats of Art. And they're a community group that they actually did part of the African Heritage uh, Wall on um, East Ferry. So they're gonna educate. They are big in the community. They love to educate and they not only do art, but they do jewelry because that's a part of art. And we're having, of course, uh, Karen Saxon, a big, um, everyone knows Karen. She's gonna be doing our national anthem, Black Anthem. And we're going to be having a jazz band. So that's our entertaining part. And you always got to put that little something in there to educate us jazz wise because we're mm -hmm. so big in music. Absolutely. I will be there. I will I'll be at yes, you will. the event. Yes. Thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited. What else can people expect when they come to the program tonight? They can expect really good food. Oof. Number one. Yeah. They can expect <laughs> really, really, really good food. And again, what we want to provide and what we tr have tried to provide for over a decade now with our Black History Month event is a space of comfort, a space of enjoyment, and a, just a space where we can talk about all the great things that have happened to us uh, and not revel in some of the things that others like to equate with black history and, and, and all those traumatic events. Black history is American history. Absolutely. Um, we have so many great heroes and sheroes that we want to talk about and celebrate and this is a space to do it. And somebody from right here in Buffalo in, right Western, here New York. in Western New York. Including yourself. <laughs> I mean, our theme this year is power of a dream. I was just going to ask I mean, you. Wow. Look at you, Miss oh, Buffalo. Thank you. Have your own show here, Power of a Dream. And it's people like you, young black women, that can educate our, our up and coming youth. And I mean, who else to have? Mm -hmm. I mean, what a mentor. What, what else could we ask for than to wow. have someone like you? Because you're living your dream. Thank you. And, and I wanted to talk to you, uh, the power of the dream. How did you guys uh, pick that? And what does it mean? Why are you focusing on that? Right. <laughs> Actually, um, one of our, we, it's three of us on the committee. It's myself, Dorothy Amerson Law, and Karen Williams. And Dorothy actually came up with this because we dream so much and it's so much power out there. What can we do at M&T Bank? Because M&T Bank is very big on diversity and what can we do in the future? So if you could dream it, why not do it? Absolutely, and that's what will be inspiring, hopefully, hopefully. that night. Um, anything else you want to talk about, especially uh, pertaining to the AARG? Because um, it's kind of special and unique. Very. There's not too many uh, resource groups out there like that. There aren't. Um, what we would love people to know um, is that Black History Month, while we, we, we revel in it and we revel in all the things that we do, um, the event is not the only thing we're doing this month. Uh, we are working with the 716 Entrepreneurs and we're doing a Kidpreneurs uh, boot camp uh, for young uh, people under 21 to talk about 
learning how to be an entrepreneur and, and, and doing it now. Uh, we're going to be working with Buffalo State University professors and we're going to be uh, doing a showing and a panel uh, talk about the woman king and the, the, the facts about the Dahomey and, and, mm -hmm. and, and all, lots of uh, women in the diaspora. Um, but we're also looking, already looking forward to Juneteenth and all the wonderful yes. things that we'll do then. Uh, and professional development that we do throughout the year, which Leona leads us on, uh, to make sure that those internal resources within M&T, again, are going to be able to move up uh, into higher levels levels within the bank because we are very concerned with making sure that every space within the bank looks like the community. Absolutely. Thank you guys for the work that you're doing. I went to an event and they gave us flowers because I was on the panel and they said we want to make sure that we're giving f flowers and celebrating in life and not just after death. Exactly. So thank you guys for continuing to celebrate African Americans and blackness and making a space for everyone that are, is there and for everyone that's coming after you. And we thank you for being our MC. <laughs> We're gonna we have fun today. Yes, we are. Yes, we thank will. you ladies so much for coming on. Thank, thank you. you. The ratings are out for this year's safest vehicles and if you are in the market for a new ride, you may find yourself with a smaller list of cars than years past. Nina Demetrius explains why fewer models made the grade this year. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety destroys dozens of cars to find out how they protect those inside. Now the IIHS is revealing which models earn a top pick. To make the grade vehicles have to perform well in crash tests, have technology to avoid crashes, and help drivers see the road clearly. This year, only 48 vehicles earned a top safety pick or safety pick plus award. It is quite the drop from last year. Last year at this time, we had a little over 100 winners. But IIHS President David Harkey says it's not so much that the cars have changed, it's because his group has made the safety testing process more rigorous. For example, the side crash test now uses a bigger barrier that mimics the larger pickups and SUVs on the road today. The vehicle must also achieve an advanced or superior rating in both the daytime and nighttime front crash prevention test for pedestrians. And then finally, that vehicle must have those good or acceptable headlights. Among automakers, the Toyota Corporation, which includes Lexus, came out on top with 15 top safety awards. Honda, which also owns Acura, was next, and Mazda came in third. One of the things we do anticipate is we will add vehicles to this list as we go through the year, as we test more vehicles, and as automakers make changes to their vehicles. Harkey says car companies that didn't make the grade are already adapting to the more difficult tests, and he anticipates more vehicles will earn top picks next year. So to come on Daytime Buffalo, lights, camera, action. What the future holds for filmmakers coming to the 716, that's next. It's a problem many people of color face, finding a shade of makeup that's deep enough or pigmented enough for their skin tone. I've struggled with this. Now today we are sharing with you the story of a woman who saw a problem in the world of cosmetics and worked to change it. It really started with this idea and belief that everyone should be able to find themselves in the world of beauty and no one should be treated like an afterthought. A simple idea with a complex answer, but one Gehanna native and now CEO of Minted uh, so Cosmetics, KJ Miller, looked to address. College. And we started the company because we couldn't find makeup that we really felt worked for our skin tones as two deeper skin black women. Miller and a classmate from Harvard Business School experienced what so many women of color face firsthand, the lack of depth and diversity in the multi-billion dollar cosmetics industry. It was hard for us to find foundation that looked right and, uh, you know, lipsticks, blushes. And out of that struggle, a company was born in 2017. We started with nude lipstick because nude lipstick sort of felt like a holy grail product that everyone should be able to find. But for us, we just couldn't find. And since then, we've expanded to every major color cosmetics category. 
This founder says she never dreamed she would become oh, yes. a makeup mogul. Now boasting of features by publications like Forbes and Essence magazine, she just knew she wanted to do something on her own, something different. And so I've launched multiple businesses, almost all of which were complete failures. Uh, um, but because I just was excited about the idea of running my own thing. And even this successful business wasn't without its challenges. We pitched a number of investors who didn't get it, who felt like the market was too niche, who felt like there are way too many makeup brands out there. And so, yeah, there were naysayers, but I would say the people who got it, got it quickly. The brand can now be found at more than 1,200 retailers, including Target, Ulta, and CVS stores around the country. And they offer dozens of products from lipsticks to powders in a diverse range of shades featured on a diverse spectrum of models. Because people need to be able to see themselves. How are they going to understand if a product works for them if none of the people who are trying it on look like them? It's a comic and film franchise known worldwide. But Black Panther's latest edition features creative work by a New Jersey writer. She's one of the leaders of a team of black writers and illustrators who produced Wakanda Forever, number one, the latest installment for the comic series for Marvel, released specifically for Black History Month. James Ford introduces you to Dr. Sheena Howard, a university professor who brings her academic credentials to the graphic novel medium. I am queen of the most powerful nation in the it's made close to a billion dollars at the box office and in streaming sales, has been nominated for five Academy Awards, and now Wakanda Forever continues to forge new ground with a newly released comic in the Black Panther series. For me, it feels like a natural progression to finally write for Marvel. Dr. Sheena Howard wrote one of the stories in the new Wakanda Forever series, but it's by no means the first publication for this professor at Ryder University. Since the end of the Civil War, this institution has had a strong tradition of academic publication. Professor Howard continues that tradition. She's written various academic books about black comics, and now... I've been writing comics since 2017. I did reach out to Marvel like a year ago, and then they finally hit me up and was like, hey, we have this anthology, we want you to write a story. Her story is about an aspiring member of the Dora Milaje, the all-female warrior protectors of Wakanda. The young Dora Milaje has locks like me, and she's dark skin, and so sometimes I do get to contribute to the aesthetic so that we can get more diversity around even what these female superheroes look like. The feedback that I've been getting over the years from the African American community is like, hey, we wanna see some African mythology in these comic stories. So in this new volume is this character called Anansi, a spider figure of West African folklore who uses brain power to overcome enormous challenges, just like the Dora Milaje character Howard created. Her fighting ability is not always going to win the fight, but she also has to use her intellect. Howard is a black female academic writing in a medium that doesn't have a lot of people that are like her. Being unique, she says, helps her work stand out. So when I go to write my stories, I'm always thinking about what can I add that's going to be different? What can I add to Marvel and DC that hasn't been done before? Thank you so much for being here. Well, Chelsea, what a privilege it is to be here this inaugural week of this great show. It's a really uh, thrilling uh, prospect for me, indeed. We're excited to have you. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit about the, the Film Commission and how it works? Sure. The Film uh, Office, uh, Film Commission, Buffalo Niagara Film Commission, started, oh, man, like around 2001 after Buffalo uh, received some notoriety from uh, Universal Pictures. It was a movie called Bruce Almighty, and it uh, starred Jim Carrey and... Um, after that, the then county executive uh, uh, and several other government officials uh, decided, you know what, we should really put something more formal together so that we can draw 
movies to Buffalo and create this industry in Buffalo. And here we are uh, so many years later and it seems to have worked, yeah. You really use your background in politics and all of that right. that you learned. You recently had a testimony to state legislature in Albany. Can right, you tell right. me a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, you know, the film tax credit program in New York State is very successful. It brings a lot of production into regions of the state that never had production before. So uh, my testimony uh, was in front of the state legislature, um, and it was really just to attest to the fact that all parts of New York State are receiving, you know, uh, movies. And there's stuff being shot uh, no longer just in New York City, which was always the traditional production area, but all parts of New York. So whether it's Syracuse uh, um, or Binghamton or certainly Albany with my um, uh, colleagues around the state, Rochester, these are great uh, uh, places uh, that uh, have, you know, great architecture and also now a great crew base that's uh, kind of grown uh, from here. And so we're spreading the wealth, as they say, throughout the state. I know a little bit about that. This, mm -hmm. uh, what you're talking about. I was told that we here in upstate New York had lower taxes, which was helping right. getting more movies to come and produce here. Is that correct? Well, it is uh, to a point. What it is is uh, we have this uh, very um, uh, lucrative uh, benefit to shoot in, in parts of New York State. But, you know, it's enhanced when you go upstate to places mm -hmm. like Buffalo. And so this proposal will be to get 40% of the qualified expenses back uh, on, uh, on what they spend. And really what it is, it's, um, it's a very impactful uh, program, uh, especially when it comes to employment. This uh, business has, has created a brand new industry, uh, and I mean new workers, uh, very uh, well-skilled and well-paid workers, as well as uh, the pro proliferation of businesses like sound stages and uh, expendable houses and camera, grip and uh, electric houses camera rental places. So those things that never were here before for movies are, are abundant now. And uh, like, you know, we traditionally think of the impact of a movie being, um, you know, like catering and maybe hotel rooms mm -hmm. and all of that kind of stuff. But it goes much, much deeper than that. You know, it, it's, uh, it's l a lot of lumber. I go back to A Quiet Place too. They, they spent over a million dollars uh, locally here on just lumber to create some of these facades and some of these great uh, locations uh, that they uh, featured in the film. Now what, you, you're touching on it, but what changes do you think need to keep happening to keep that business strong here in business New uh, in Western New York? Well, we need to sort of uh, uh, up the game a little bit in upstate um, because, um, you know, there always was this advantage of going upstate with a little bit of extra, you know, inducement to come up here. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is because the program has been so successful, and there was this cap, this $420 million cap where they couldn't exceed it each year, the legislature held that in place. Well, as it turns out, what they roll it over. So now it takes like three to four years to get the money back, and it just is no good. So we're losing a lot of productions to places like New, New Jersey, Jersey and yes. Ohio and uh, Atlanta. Actually, uh, the whole state of Georgia has a very, very uh, lucrative uh, thing. So that's what we're uh, up against, and I think we're going to fix it, though, because as I say, I, I uh, know the governor and know, known her for many years, and I just know her heart is right here in western New York, and she's going to work this out. And there's so much talent here in New York State. Obviously, we have New York City, but those kids are willing to come up. I have friends, and yeah. we have schools like Ithaca oh, College sure. has a great, um, uh, you know, uh, I have to tell you, right up the street here, I'm from Channel 4, uh, Buffalo State College has a great television, television and film arts program. Mm -hmm. Villa Maria College is another uh, uh, school that's uh, developed this. There are jobs now in an in industry that would have never been possible here before. You know, you'd, if you graduated with a degree like this, you'd have to move to Hollywood or mm -hmm. to New York City or, you know, to a bigger production center. But now it's happening right here in Western New York, and that's an exciting, exciting prospect indeed. So, Tim, here in Western New York, especially in Buffalo, we've seen a lot of period pieces taking right, place right. and pr being produced here. Is that still happening? It is, and in fact, Western New York, it's really a treasure trove of uh, great architectural assets from a variety of different periods in American history. Uh, I can tell you the movie Marshall that was here a few years ago, starring the great, uh, late uh, Chadwick Boseman. They came here just for the courthouse, but man, they ended up shooting the whole movie here. And it happens so frequently where we uh, get uh, uh, people that come in here and they say, man, you have great architecture. Guillermo del Toro, love the Art Deco pieces that uh, he shot uh, 
uh, here for Nightmare Alley. We're hearing that you know he may want to come back and visit us again soon. We're hopeful for that. Uh, but he sees uh, the beauty in the architecture and knows that it could be placed in a lot of different periods of time. With the great mixture of buildings from every time period in American history, we can create just about anything. We've doubled for places like Los Angeles, uh, like um, uh, Chicago. Uh, we've doubled for places even uh, like Georgia, weirdly, uh, Savannah, Georgia. We, we did a little movie here a few years ago. So we are now capable of doing all kinds of things because of these great assets that we have. Now tell me quickly a little sure. tease about what's Ooh. up and coming. Chelsea, I don't know if I can tell you this, <laughs> but uh, well, we've got a, we're working on a bunch of stuff. I probably have the weirdest job in Buffalo because there's we're the so coolest. well, yeah, it depends how you look at it. It's weird for me, but we, there, we know a lot of stuff, but we can't talk a lot of, about a lot of it because it's uh, highly secretive, highly confidential, that kind of thing. Uh, but we are working on a um, pretty big movie with some really big movie stars, and if it goes, it'll go this summer and uh, it'll shoot this summer hopefully. Uh, we're also working on uh, another one that should be shooting in about a month or so and that one will also have some uh, high name talent. So I think you're going to see a lot of movie trucks, a lot of movie stars and a lot of activity uh, you know buzzing around Buffalo pretty soon and Niagara Falls I should say. Okay. Yeah. Well yeah. that's showbiz baby. We're going to have to wait and see. <laughs> it's all lights, cameras in action and daytime Buffalo. Go figure. There you go. Tim thank you so much for coming on the show. We've loved having you and we cannot wait to see the amazing Well, it's a products. pleasure. Let's cling to that. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Chelsea. <laughs> so to come, we've got Doug Yeomans from the West Ball Center for the Arts to talk about the nonprofit's mission and to play us a song. And it's Friday. We cap off our week with a visit from a local mixologist. Wax Like Bar is in to make us a simple but timeless cocktail. Stick around. People consider Ebony and Jet magazines the social media for black people in the 20th century. The magazine told significant stories to communities of color, much of it told through pictures. Now those photographs are getting new life thanks to a multi-million dollar purchase. As Donna Terrell reports, the historic images will now live on forever. Go now we in it. Black is black, that's pretty good. Through a camera lens. Oh, that's you. 85-year-old Roy Lewis produces images. An artist has time to create sculpture, painting, but a photographer, we only have seconds. It's a second. And with each second, a story is told. This is called the lion, the lioness, and the cub. I tell people that I write with pictures. In 1956, Lewis began working here at Johnson Publishing Company, JPC in Chicago, which produced Negro Digest, Jet, and Ebony magazines in the mid-40s, the pioneers in storytelling for black households around the country. It represented the, the mountain, you know, the top of the mountain for black journalists. Within these pages, photographers like Lewis made history. Now their camera film roles live on after the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Getty Research Institute acquired the historic JPC archive. It includes photos, negatives, and contact sheets spanning more than seven decades. Perhaps my favorite image is this image of Marvin Gaye. Um, who many know that his father was a minister. Part of the $30 million collection can be seen here at the museum's Spirit in the Dark exhibit. Black life is seen through historical figures in entertainment, religion, and politics. Each camera flash reveals the blurred lines between music, activism, and pop culture connected by common themes. They were uh, wrestling with the issues of their own times, and um, the role of religion was, was prominent in their, in their stories. Also in the exhibit, treasures, like the typewriter used to transcribe notes for Malcolm X. We see in his highlightings. And Little Richard's coveted Bible. The struggle that he had with the religious community around his own, um, his own sexuality. What's here is only a snapshot 
of the rolls of film containing more than 4 million visuals soon to be available to the public. Many of these images will really focus on just the regular person. That's true across the board. I think it's really important for people, particularly young people, to be able to see themselves somehow, not just reflected in the photograph, to see their humanity reflected in the photograph, but to see themselves reflected in, in the history that the photograph documents. I can remember going to the beauty salon with my mother, and the first thing that I wanted to get were the Ebony and Jet magazines because they portrayed the uh, black community in, in very wonderful ways. That passion relived through what was captured in the lens. You hold these images in your hand and it's, it's, it's like a found jewel in many ways. That's a big deal to be able to have several pages of your work in Ebony. It is a real big deal. As the millions of photos come back into frame, Lewis's work will likely be among them. He stopped working for JPC in 1968. I took a leave. I'm actually still on leave. <laughs> I'm still on leave. Lewis continued his work in photography and film, but his heart never left the magazine company that captivated millions of people, and now possibly millions more through the power of an image. Joining us today here on Daytime Buffalo is Doug Yeomans from West Falls Center for the Art. Thank you, Doug, for coming on. Nice to be here. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about West Falls Center for the Arts. Well, we started this place probably six, seven years ago, and um, it was uh, the brainchild of uh, myself and uh, my two good friends, Carolyn and Bill Panzica. They called me and said, come on out and check out the building. It used to be a bakery. And uh, it'd be sitting there for a while, and, and, and it needed something to happen in there. So we, I said, well, let's do some concerts. So we started that and started kind of small, and we've blossomed into something that's pretty, pretty big. Yeah, speaking of pretty big, a lot of us, many of us, have been touched by the terrible disease of dementia right. and Alzheimer's. And, and it's really hard to watch your family slip away. But you guys... Uh, do the Musical Memory Cafe. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, that's a very successful thing. Uh, we hoped to get a few people to come out. We get so many coming out. It's great. Uh, people who are taking care of their loved ones, bring them out, and at noon, we do, well, twice a month, we do a lunch for them and play music. And the looks on the faces and the reactions are so heart heartwarming. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really a beautiful thing. I personally have known this. Both my great grandparents, uh, my pop mama and pop pop, uh, struggled with Alzheimer's, and it was hard because I was the last grandchild that they could remember. Uh -huh. So, talk to me a little bit about what you see when you play music from their time, and how that kind of sparks their memory to come back just for a glimpse. Just for a little bit, yeah. It's very, very heartwarming. Uh, it's we see people mouthing the words. People that don't talk much, they're singing the songs. Uh, there's one gentleman that stands up. He can't walk, but he'll stand up out of his wheelchair and start dancing. Isn't that incredible, the power of music? Right. It turns on something in the brain. We forget how we listen to it every day on our rides to work, at the gym, but we don't realize sometimes how powerful it is. It literally, for I, I know for a family member, if I got to see my great grandma start mouthing the words again when she was still alive, that would have been everything, especially to my grandmother. Yeah, I, I totally get it. I get it. I've seen it. It works. And uh, talk to me a little bit about more about the West Falls Center, because you want people to know it's not too far away, right? No, it's not. It's in West Falls, which is, uh, I live in Orchard Park. It's 10 minutes from me. There's West Valley, which is a little farther down the road that people think it is. But uh, no, it's, it's not far from Buffalo at all. Uh, Everything's probably, 20 minutes away, right? That's what they say. That's, what 20, we, 25 that's why minutes. we live in Western New York, isn't yeah. it? We do all kinds of great things. We have a youth mentoring program. I teach, along with a couple other musicians, we teach kids how to play in a band and then they get to do performances. We do free music lessons, guitar and ukulele for vets. Our vets program is very big. We do culinary uh, events. We do all kinds of community events. Um, 
and, uh, and we hold concerts, which helps to pay for these things. And we have the best of local Western New York entertainment as well as out-of-town entertainment coming through. We have national acts that come through wow. all the time and inter international acts. And how long have you guys been doing this for? Uh, I guess about six, seven years. I can't remember the exact time. Yeah, okay, com but, creeping uh, up on a decade now. It's a beautiful place. It's become one of my favorite places to perform and, and to go and watch other people perform. Well, speaking of performances, we are honored to have you perform to, with us today, our first in-studio guest. Please, take All it All right. Out. This is a tune I wrote a few years ago. It's called Did I Tell You. I write songs a lot from, from uh, titles. And this one, just one day, I said, did I tell you? What could I do with that? Let's see what happens. All right, tell me something. All right. Did I tell you today that I love you? Did I tell you today that I care? Did I show you today in every way? Did I say that I'd always be there? Did I tell you today that I love you? And did I tell you I'd write you a song? Can you sing it with me in such sweet harmony? It can laughter our whole life long. When the darkness of night falls around us and the lights are turned way down low, I will whisper to you in love that is true. So in all of your dreams, you will know that I'll be there to hold you forever. Hug you and kiss you goodnight. Keep you safe in my arms, far away from our home. Try to make everything right. When the darkness of night falls around us, and the lights are turned way down low. I will whisper to you of a love that is true, so in all of your dreams you will know that I'll be there to hold you forever, to hug you and kiss you goodnight, keep you safe in my arms, far away from our home, try to make everything right. Keep you safe in my arms, far away from all harm. Try to make everything right. so much for coming on My and pleasure. being our first performer on Daytime Buffalo. We'd love to have you back. We're going to be right back. What better way to cap off the end of the work week than with a cocktail? We've got Wax Light Bar in next. Keep it here. <laughs> <laughs>